Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is period and frequency of sinusoidal waveforms. Our objective is to define period and frequency and learn to evaluate sinusoidal functions with respect to time. This lecture is predicated on the assumption that the viewers watch the sine waves and peak and effective values lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. This lecture presumes the viewer is familiar with radians, degrees, and can convert between these two positional measurement units, has a passing familiarity with a sine function, and can calculate peak, peak-to-peak, -peak, and effective magnitudes. Thus far, we've been treating the sine function as if it were a machine that eats angles and spits out values. On an entirely impractical mathematical level, this is true, but for our more practical purposes, sinusoidal phenomena like voltage and current are better thought of in terms of time. As we discussed in the aforementioned lecture, sinusoidal voltage is the result of rotational generators where angular position of the rotor at any specific moment influences output voltage magnitude. Given the rotor of a generator is continually driven in a circular path at a specific rotational speed, one should be able to establish some equivalency between degrees and time. This is pretty easy if you view this in terms of a unit conversion. Several quantities characterize sinusoidal voltage in generators and motors notably rotational speed, period, and frequency. Rotational speed, symbolized by an N for some unknown reason, is expressed in units of revolutions per minute, or RPM. Consider a generator shaft being driven at 3600 RPM. This means if an observer counted complete revolutions of the shaft for one full minute, they would observe 3600 revolutions. Frequency, symbolized by an F, is a related quantity which expresses the number of revolutions per second in units of hertz, where one revolution or one cycle per second is one hertz. The same generator shaft, driven at 3600 revolutions per minute, would also be driven at a frequency of 3600 revolutions over 60 seconds by means of a unit conversion, or more succinctly, 60 revolutions per second, or 60 hertz. This means if an observer counted complete revolutions of the shaft for only one second, they would observe only 60 revolutions. Both rotational speed and frequency are related units, being a number of revolutions or cycles per unit time. It should be noted that a full revolution is one full cycle of the voltage waveform being comprised of both a positive half and a negative half. As we'll learn in later lectures, generators can be driven at different rotational speeds and still output a frequency of 60 Hz if we increase or decrease the number of magnetic poles. However, for this simple example, let's assume a one-to-one -one correspondence such that one full revolution of the generator rotor results in one full positive to negative to back again cycle of the voltage waveform. Period, symbolized by a capital T for some unknown reason, in contrast is the time per single revolution. Given the above generator accomplishes 60 revolutions per second, simply inverting this frequency figure results in a period of 1 60th of a second or more appropriately, approximately 16.7 milliseconds per revolution. This means every 16.7 milliseconds, an observer would count the single revolution of the shaft. Given frequency is the number of cycles per unit time, and period is the time it takes to complete a single cycle, it can be said that period is the inverse of frequency, and by extension, frequency is the inverse of period. If you increase the frequency, or cycles per second, the period or time per revolution should decrease, and vice versa. Put your understanding of rotational speed, frequency, and period to the test by solving for the following quantities. Again, for the purposes of this introductory lecture, we're assuming rotational speed and frequency have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence. I'll come back to correct this once we discuss generators and motors with more than a single pole pair per phase. By all means, pause the lecture and give this your best shot. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following values. Given a rotational speed of 1800 RPM, we can perform a unit conversion to show that this is a frequency of 30 Hertz. Inverting this frequency, we can find this has a period of approximately 33.3 milliseconds. Given a frequency of 50 Hertz, we can perform a unit conversion to show that this is a rotational speed of 3000 RPM. Inverting the frequency, we find this has a period of 20 milliseconds. Finally, Given a period of 12 milliseconds, we can invert this to show that this is a frequency of approximately 83.3 Hz, and then perform a unit conversion to demonstrate that this is a rotational speed of 5000 RPM.
Note the inverse ratio of frequency and period. As frequency increases, period decreases, and vice versa. What all these different qualities, rotational speed, frequency, and period are trying to convey is essentially the same thing. It takes time to travel the full 360 degrees of a circle. What this means with respect to the sine wave is that the output voltage, previously a function of angular position of a generator shaft, can also be expressed as a function of time. Consider a generator with a 50 Hz frequency or 20 millisecond period. Assuming we start at our agreed upon reference in the far right hand side and travel in a counterclockwise direction, it would take 20 milliseconds to travel the full 360 degrees. This is the equivalency we seek. 360 degrees equals 20 milliseconds. Operating under the assumption that vertical alignment of the rotor north to south induces maximum positive voltage and vertical alignment of the rotor south to north induces maximum negative voltage, we initiate generation at zero degrees or zero seconds where output voltage is zero because the rotor magnetic poles are equidistant from the stator poles. During the course of one full revolution counterclockwise, voltage would peak out positively at 90 degrees or 5 milliseconds, a quarter of the way into our 20 millisecond period. Let's assume this generator peaks out at 325.3 volts. Continuing our counterclockwise revolution, voltage would again cross zero going negative at 180 degrees or 10 milliseconds halfway into our 20 millisecond period. As at the start, the rotor magnetic poles are equidistant from the stator poles and output voltage is zero volts. Continued counterclockwise direction would see the voltage peak out negatively at 270 degrees or 15 milliseconds, essentially three quarters of the way into a 20 millisecond period. At this time, output voltage would bottom out at negative 325.3 volts. Finally, voltage would hit zero volts again, going positive, having gone full circle at 360 degrees or 20 milliseconds. If this was a continuous phenomenon, every 20 milliseconds, the sine wave would essentially repeat itself, beginning at the zero crossing going positive. Graphically, period can be calculated as the time between identical points on the sine wave. Given the repetitive nature of sine waves, one can use the time span between zero crossings going positive, the time span between zero crossings going negative, the time span between positive peaks, the time span between negative peaks, or any other identifiable point on the sine wave. However, if you use any other point than the zero crossing going positive, you are doing it wrong. The zero crossing going positive is immediately recognizable and unmistakable, even by the dimmest of lab partners. In summary, to graphically measure the period, use the zero crossings going positive. Given we've established that output voltage of a generator is a sinusoidal function dependent upon angle, if we want to know output voltage at specific times, we need to convert between times and angles. Let's say we want to know the output voltage at 2.8 milliseconds. We need to convert 2.8 milliseconds into degrees. Given we're being asked to convert from time to degrees, the conversion factor needs to be set up such that units of time cancel out and units of degrees remain. 2.8 milliseconds times 360 degrees over 20 milliseconds yields an angular position of approximately 50.4 degrees. Substituting this angular position into a sine wave function with a peak value of 325.3 volts yields a value of 325.3 volts times 0.7705 or approximately 250.6 volts. By the way, if you're getting an incorrect value of 43.6 volts, it's because you failed to set up your calculator in degree mode as asked, and it's assuming you mean 50.4 radians. Your calculator must be in degree mode for this to work. Given we can establish some equivalency between degrees and time, we should be able to do this in a single step. The value of this function could be more succinctly represented as 325.3 volts times the sine of 360 times the time of interest divided by the period of 20 milliseconds. Or more generally, the peak value times the sine of 360 times the time of interest over the period. Note the general form is expressing voltage as being dependent upon time rather than angle. The math inside the parentheses simply converts time into angles and units of degrees usable by the sine function. While understandable, this format isn't especially pretty because of the ugly division inside the parentheses.
add to this fact that period isn't an especially common specification. Ordinarily, frequency is used to specify AC voltage. Given there exists an inverse relationship between period and frequency, we can write output voltage as a function of time being equal to the peak value times the sine of 360 times the frequency times the time of interest. For the specific example, the general expression would be V of T is being equal to 325.3 volts times the sine of 360 times 50 times the time of interest. To solve for the output voltage at specific times, simply substitute the time of interest and let the math take you where it may. Using this single step formula, it can again be demonstrated that output voltage at 2.8 milliseconds is approximately 250.6 volts. Let's say we want to know the output voltage at 3.5 milliseconds. We would substitute 3.5 milliseconds into our voltage as a function of time formula. Performing the unit conversion inside the parentheses first yields 325.3 volts times the sine of 63 degrees. This yields 325.3 volts times 0 0.8910 or approximately 289.8 volts. Put your understanding of time variant sine functions to the test by solving for the following values. Be cautious because I've hidden a couple tough ones in here that might take some thought and effort. Example 1 has a frequency of 60 Hz, a peak voltage of 169.7 volts, where we're being asked to determine the output voltage at 2.2 milliseconds. Example 2 is a period of 12 milliseconds, a peak voltage of 59.4 volts, where we're being asked to determine the voltage at 8 milliseconds. Example 3 has a frequency of 150 Hz, an effective or RMS voltage of 24 volts. Note the dramatic emphasis I'm using, and we're being asked to determine the voltage at 1.3 milliseconds. Finally, example 4 has a frequency of 1.2 kHz, a peak to peak voltage of 70.5 volts, and we're being asked to determine the voltage at 1.5 milliseconds. By the way, it should go without stating that it's necessary to derive the formula for voltage as a function of time prior to solving for the voltage at specific times for each example problem. By all means, pause the lecture and give this your best shot. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following values. For the first example problem, we're given a peak value of 169.7 volts and a frequency of 60 Hz. Our time variant sine wave function resolves itself into 169.7 volts times the sine of 360 times 60 times the time of interest. Substituting in 2.2 milliseconds, the expression in parentheses yields an angle of approximately 47.5 degrees. Sine of 47.5 degrees is approximately 0.7375, and multiplying this by the peak value of 169.7 volts yields approximately 125.2 volts. For the second example problem, we're being given a peak value of 59.4 volts and a period of 12 milliseconds. A period of 12 milliseconds is equal to a frequency of approximately 83.3 hertz. Our time variant sine wave function resolves itself into 59.4 volts times the sine of 360 times 83.3 times the time of interest. Substituting 8 milliseconds, the expression in the parentheses yields an angle of 240 degrees. The sine of 240 degrees is approximately negative 0.8660, and multiplying this times a peak value of 59.4 volts yields approximately negative 51.4 volts. For the third example problem, we're given an effective or RMS value of 24 volts. This is equivalent to a peak value of square root 2 times 24 volts, or approximately 33.9 volts. Hopefully you didn't fall into this trap. Peak values are always greater than effective values. Additionally, we're given a frequency of 150 Hz. Our time variant sine function resolves itself into 33.9 volts times the sine of 360 times 150 times the time of interest. Substituting in 1.3 milliseconds, the expression in parentheses yields an angle of 70.2 degrees. Sine of 70.2 degrees is approximately 0.9409. Multiplying this times the peak value of 33.9 volts, yields an output voltage of approximately 31.9 volts. For the fourth example problem, we're given a peak-to-peak -peak value of 70.5 volts and a frequency of 1.2 kilohertz. Given peak-to-peak -peak is two times peak, this waveform has a peak value of half that, or 35.25 volts. Again, hopefully you didn't fall into this easy trap. Our time variant voltage function resolves itself into 35.25 volts times the sine of 360 
times 1,200 times the time of interest. Substituting in 1.5 milliseconds, the expression in parentheses yields an angle of 648 degrees. What does this mean? It means exactly what you think it does. Given such a high frequency of 1.2 kilohertz, 1.5 milliseconds into it will result in more than one complete revolution around the 360 degree circle. Think about it. Something operating at 1.2 kilohertz has a period of only approximately 833.3 microseconds, or roughly 0.8333 milliseconds. Substituting 1.5 milliseconds into our analysis means that the waveform is peaked and valleyed and peaked again and is in the process of climbing out of yet another valley at 648 degrees minus 360 degrees or 288 degrees. Regardless, sine of 648 or 288 is approximately negative 0.9511 and multiplying this times the peak value of 35.25 volts yields an output voltage of approximately negative 33.5 volts. Let's come at the concept of period and frequency from a different perspective. Given these plots of sinusoidal voltage as a function of time, see if you can determine the peak value, the peak to peak value, the RMS or effective value, the period, and the frequency as well as express these sinusoidally variant voltage waveforms as functions of time. Our first example in red looks like it has a peak value of 20 volts. This is equivalent to a peak to peak value of 40 volts. This means the red waveform has an effective value of approximately 14.1 volts. Again, the effective value is always less than the peak, and the peak is always greater than the RMS value. The time span between zero crossings going positive looks to be 13 milliseconds. A period of 13 milliseconds is equivalent to a frequency of roughly 76.9 hertz. When we express voltage as a function of time, we arrive at the expression V1 of T equals 20 volts times the sine of 360 times 76.9 times the time of interest. Given the relationship between peak value and effective or RMS value, one might also see this expression written as V1 of T equal to the square root of 2 times 14.1 volts times the sine of 360 times 76.9 times the time of interest, making it exceedingly obvious this waveform has an effective value of roughly 14.1 volts. See if you can perform the exact same procedure for the waveform in yellow. By all means, pause the lecture and take your best shot. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following answers. The second example in yellow looks like it has a peak value of 22 volts. This is equivalent to a peak to peak value of 44 volts and an effective value of approximately 15.6 volts. The time span between the zero crossings going positive looks to be 9 milliseconds. A period of 9 milliseconds is equivalent to a frequency of roughly 111.1 hertz. When we express the sinusoidally variant voltage waveform as a function of time, we arrive at the expression V2 of T equals 22 volts times the sine of 360 times 111.1 times the time of interest. As previously, given the relationship between peak and effective or RMS value, one might also see this expression written as V2 of T equals the square root of 2 times 15.6 volts times the sine of 360 times 111.1 times the time of interest, making it exceedingly obvious this waveform has an effective value of roughly 15.6 volts. Note if we were to display the first and second waveform on the same plot using the same vertical and horizontal scale, note the red waveform's period is longer, corresponding to a lower frequency, and the yellow waveform's period is shorter, corresponding to a higher frequency. As a result, the yellow waveform with a higher frequency and smaller period can fit more cycles into the same time span than can the red waveform. It makes sense. Since we've got both expressions right in front of us, we should be able to solve for voltage at specific times. Let's say we're interested in the voltage differential between the red and yellow waveform at 16 milliseconds. Substituting a time of 16 milliseconds into each equation results in the red waveform having a value of approximately positive 19.9 volts and the yellow waveform having a value of approximately negative 21.7 volts. It can be therefore said that at 16 milliseconds, the red waveform is positive 19.9 volts minus minus 21.7 volts, or approximately 41.5 volts higher than the yellow waveform. The point being that when calculating differential between two sinusoidal waveforms with differing magnitude, frequency, and or phase shift, 
one can at times arrive at differentials exceeding either individual waveform's peak value. Similarly, there exist moments in time when these waveforms briefly equal each other such that no differential exists. Notably here, 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 and here. All right, that about wraps up this quick lecture on period and frequency. In conclusion, this lecture examined period and frequency of sine wave functions. We learned to calculate period and frequency numerically and graphically, as well as evaluate sinusoidal functions with respect to time. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.